Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinSwift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything's on the One, the First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, hop on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be glad you did. As always, whether you're listening to our audio podcast or watching on video on YouTube or at FunkinSwift.net, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. This episode features innovative music producer and engineer Robert Margoleff, who, along with collaborator Malcolm Cecil, spent the first half of the 1970s helping Stevie Wonder record some of the most treasured soul, funk, and pop creations of all time. That period includes the Wonder Masterpieces, Music of My Mind, Talking Book, Inner Visions, and Fulfilling His First Finale, which included classic songs such as Superwoman, You Are the Sunshine of My Life, Superstition, Maybe Your Baby, Living for the City, Higher Ground, Jesus Children of America, Don't You Worry About a Thing, Boogie on Reggae Woman, You Haven't Done Nothing, Creepin', and Heaven is 10 Zillion Light Years Away. Truly, drop the needle, laser, or click anywhere on those four astounding albums, and you'll find a classic composition and heart-stopping performance. Never has a recording artist been more at the top of his or her game than Wonder was during that stretch. But as mentioned, even though they toiled in relative anonymity for much of the ensuing decades, Wonder had some very special help. According to Wikipedia, by helping Stevie Wonder develop many new textures and sounds never heard before, Margolov and Cecil played a major role in bringing synthesizers to the forefront of popular music. As an influential electronic music duo called Tonto's Expanding Headband, they recorded the 1971 album Zero Time, attracting attention from many other leading artists of that era to the newly emerging music technology. Among the heads that record turned was Wonders, after hearing it at a time when he was really looking to establish himself as a solo artist out from, other Mo from under Motown's shadow, Wonder sought the duo out. Together, they then collaborated using the Tonto apparatus. Tonto was an acronym for the original New Timbrel Orchestra, the first and still the largest multi-timbrel polyphonic analog synthesizer in the world, designed and constructed over several years by Cecil. Tonto started as a Moog Modular Synthesizer Series 3, owned by Margolov. Later, a second Moog 3 was added, then four Oberheim SEMs, two ARP 2600s, modules from Surge with Moog-like panels, EMS, Roland, Yamaha, etc., plus several custom modules. Later, digital sound generation circuitry and a collection of sequencers were added along with MIDI control. This thing was truly groundbreaking. It was like a giant Frankenstein's monster, if you will, of synthesizers, keyboards, and electronic technology. Analog, that is. All of that was housed in an instantly recognizable semicircle of huge, curving wooden cabinets, 20 feet in diameter and 6 feet tall. It can be seen on the cover of Gil Scott Heron's album called 1980. Margolov also worked later on with and produced music with the likes of Billy Preston, Devo, Jeff Beck, Robin Trower, David Sanborn, Depeche Mode, Oingo Boingo, the Doobie Brothers, Quincy Jones, Bobby Walmack, the Isley Brothers, Weather Report, Stephen Stills, Dave Mason, Little Feet, Joan Baez, Paul Rogers, and many others. Here, Margolef reveals how he gravitated toward a career in music production and engineering. The magical and mystical time working with Wonder, subsequent disappointment and not receiving due recognition, not to mention compensation. Some of the other artists he worked with, his perspectives on music technology and its effect on human beings, how he continues to push the ambient music and audio engineering envelope, and why he wishes Stevie Wonder would return to making socially charged music again to help us through today's challenging times. I found Margolov to be charming, amusing, and fascinating. Music lovers the world over forever indebted to him for the key role he played in facilitating, facilitating Wonder's glorious genius. So sit back and enjoy. 
I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Rocket Ship, Mr. Robert Margoliff, a legendary electronic music producer, pioneer, engineer, best known for his involvement with the innovative Tonto synthesizer, and subsequently Stevie Wonder's early 1970s masterworks, and his collaborations with a host of other great artists. Robert, it's a pleasure to have you today. How are you? It's my pleasure to be aboard. Thank you. Uh, you're coming to us from Los Angeles, is that correct? Hollywood, California. And strangely enough, um, when I first came to Hollywood with Stevie uh, back in 1972, we um, uh, ended up at a studio called Crystal Recording Studios, which is just down the street from my house. So here I am, the full circle. I don't know, since 1972, here it is, what, 2018. And I'm across the living literally across the street from the first studio I worked in in Hollywood. So it uh, it was uh, kind of magical. I'm happy to been living here for about a year. Now we're going to uh, get into it in just a moment, but before we do, I want to uh, share with you and let our viewers know uh, just how special some of the work that you have done is to me, and I'm sure to them as well. Um, you know, when I was a kid, some of the first records I ever bought. Uh, on 45s were things like Higher Ground and Living for the City. And the first full album I ever had was fulfilling this first finale. And Stevie Wonder was my first favorite artist. So it was definitely a thrill to be able to talk to you today. So let's get a little background on you, uh, Robert. You know, how did you, uh, you know, you had a very interesting uh, sort of circuitous uh, route to music, I think you would agree. I know that you were a, uh, combat photographer, I think, and got into film and then into music. Could you kind of encapsulate uh, how you first got into music? Music has always been in my family. And uh, so how did I get into music? I started taking piano lessons from Mr. Grain uh, when I was uh, 11 years old. My sister was a concert pianist, seven years older than I am. My brother, 10 years older than I am, played jazz piano in the house all the time, sort of uh, stride, kind of 30 style. And uh, I've always been around music. I, when I was in high school, junior high school and high school, I uh, went to a prep school up in Massachusetts, which was down the street from Tanglewood, which is the summer home of the Boston Symphony. Mm -hmm. And I ended up there on scholarship for two summers, the summer home of the Boston Symphony, and studied under some great Great, compo uh, great conductors, Leonard Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, um, I don't know, the list goes on, Charles Munch, Pierre Monteux, instilled in me a tremendous love of music. I didn't know exactly how to express it. I went to New York and uh, ended up going to Manhattan School of Music when I started college for a couple of years, but uh, lost interest in that and decided it was just before the Vietnam War was really getting into full swing. And I enlisted in the army, and I said, you know, I, the other the other love in my life is photography, and uh, I want to really be a filmmaker. I uh, I was in New York. I was uh, in a group called the Scola Cantorum, which was the choir of the Boston of the uh, New York Philharmonic. So I was working as a ringer every Christmas. I'd sing the Handel Messiah a hundred times to jack up all the choirs, all the college choirs all over New York City and Boston. Uh, from my days at Tanglewood and so forth. And uh, I came to the inescapable conclusion that I was not going to be another Enrico Caruso, that I was okay as a tenor, but I really didn't have the chops for it. So I decided to move toward photography, which I did, and uh, loved it and decided that I, since the draft was at my back, um, in the army, I decided to enlist because it enabled me to um, become uh, choose my military occupational specialty. And what I chose was motion picture photography, and I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where I was trained as a combat photographer. Uh, went to Europe, uh, courtesy of the U.S. Army, uh, became a combat photographer, did a lot of work, loved it decided after I got out of the service to stay in Europe, and I worked uh, for the Stuttgart Staatsoper Ballet as a ballet photographer, which was very, very 
enlightening to me because I had a tremendous background in classical music. I really understood what was going on. But that's the backstory. After the army, I uh, came back and settled in the East Village and uh, decided that I was going to become a filmmaker. My parents, of course, were very happy about it being very doting Jewish parents. My son, the film mogul, of course, you know, and uh, they expected me to be sort of very straight laced and, you know, oh, he's doing commercials. He's doing good things. He's a cameraman and he's a film mogul. The reality was I was living across the street from the Fillmore East. Um, it was a very psychedelic times to say the least. Um, I found my way there and I found music and uh, in my travels, I ended up at a club called the Cerebrum, which was an early club. It was built by, strangely enough, by John Stork, who today is uh, probably one of the premier studio designers of all time. It was his club. And I went up there and I heard a sort of very early Moog synthesizer. It was sitting on the floor in the sound booth and it was bleeping and blooping. And I said to myself, man, that's really fantastic. I love the sound of that. And at the time I had sort of graduated in filmmaking and I was producing an underground feature film called Chow Manhattan. Uh, it was with all the refugees from the, from the factory, Andy Warhol's guys, Paul America, Viva, uh, 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 Edie Sedgwick, all these kind of refugee, kind of drug-addled people, Max's Kansas City, the Silver 60s, vitamin shots, hair is on Broadway. It was crazy times. And I was busy making the feature film, and I said, you know, that synthesizer, that's a good way to make music for my, for my feature film. I don't have to do anything, and I just love what it's doing. I uh, ended up getting a synthesizer in my studio where I was shooting inserts for uh, at a studio on 47th Street. And I was shooting inserts up there for Chow Manhattan for my feature. And I ran headlong into the arms of Electronica. And I never looked back. The film sort of fell away. I'm still dealing with it, would you believe, with Edie's estate now, what, 48 years later. But uh, I found the synthesizer and decided that this was the only thing I was really interested in. I became consumed by it and uh, ended up, uh, the studio went away, the film ran out of money, I, another producer came on board and I ended up with my Moog 3 synthesizer that we became friends with Bob Moog. And I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. How, how much did that cost back then? Oh man, I don't even remember something like twelve thousand dollars. The synthesizer, Bob Moog came to the studio, and uh, there were only a few of us that had synthesizers. It was uh, Wendy Carlos, myself, Walter Sear, and Peter Nero. We were the first original owners of it, and I started making working with a friend of mine named Gino, and we started working in the studio. And I suddenly found myself days would go by and I wouldn't come out of there. Uh, I loved the music so much. Uh, that went, all that stuff went by the wayside, and uh, I ended up uh, moving along and ended up about two years later at a place called Media Sound, where I met Malcolm Cecil, who was the night maintenance man and also a great jazzer. And um, he said, what are you doing? I had the synthesizer at Media Sound in Studio A, and I had become... Um, the resident synthesis, the sort of the, I looked like a crazy U-boat captain. I had long hair, a joint sticking out of my mouth. People didn't know what to think of it. And I was, ended up, you know, making sounds for, for TV commercials. But at night, Malcolm and I would, uh, he, we had a deal. He said, I'll teach you how to really become a first class recording engineer if you teach me how to play the synthesizer. It was a deal. Uh, I ended up uh, on some sort of an acid trip and came up with the name back in the day. I, I did it now. Uh, I came up with the name Tonto's Expanding Headband, which really was the original Neo Tambral Orchestra. And now, what year is this, uh, Robert? 1971. Uh, we ended up uh, 
doing stuff at night when the studio was closed because the studio was basically a uh, uh, set up for television and radio commercials. And it was like Union House. And uh, if people, musicians worked after six o'clock at night, it was double scale stuff. So basically the, the commercial studio, students, uh, studio companies generally skedaddled out of the studio by six o'clock because they were avoiding that. So we pretty much had the studio to ourselves at night. Malcolm was the night maintenance man because with analog equipment, of course, it starts breaking the minute you turn it on. So uh, we got there and we started making this very wacky music and it was really sort of soundscape style. And uh, we ended up with an album. Herbie Mann heard us one night, he came by, he says, what are you guys doing? And we said, we're doing our own thing. It's not, I'm not even sure if it's music. And uh, he said, all right, well, I have a vanity label on Atlantic. It's called Embryo Records. Here's $5,000. Go make your record. Enjoy yourself, which we did. Stevie Wonder heard the record. The next thing we know on a hot summer night, there's a knocking on Sunday night. And there's a knocking at the studio door. Malcolm had an apartment up on the second floor with the windows overlooking the street. We heard someone banging on the door of the studio down. We looked down. There was Stevie in his chartreuse jumpsuit with our album under his arm. And the rest, of course, as we started working, the rest, of course, is history. And, uh, wow. So when and how did you come up with the uh, Tonto acronym? I uh, had been on an acid trip, and I said to myself, I know the name for our band, and it's going to be Tonto's Expanding Headband. It just came to me out of the wind, and then afterwards we thought of the acronym to fit it. <laughs> but Tonto, the Indian traveler uh -huh. on a horse with a headband, mm -hmm. headband, it all kind of fit together. It was completely nonsensical, and... Uh, I think it was the last time I used acid as well. But uh, I did have my adventures back in the day. I, I do admit it. And uh, Ken Kesey was out there, of course. And, you know, the whole thing was kind of legal at that point. It was an interesting time. It was very enlightened. Artists were supposed to be able to get loaded in. We used to like to watch artists loaded on stage and destroy their equipment and stuff. It used to be something we liked to view as a part of the music experience and with the hip generation and Richie Havens and Earth and the Woodstock and Hair on Broadway and did, and did, stuff you, make it, did you make it to Woodstock? I did actually and uh, I went with Richie. I wrote with Richie strange enough he's one of my first clients Richie Havens hmm. back in the day. Yeah so Stevie Wonder you met him um, how did the, the conversation go? And at what point did you realize oh, that was, you could actually work together? What happened was that our album was released on Atlantic called Zero Time. And Zero Time was a very, for its time, very adventurous. First of all, we didn't even think about the concept of uh, a 12 note tone roll. We didn't think that synthesizers were keyboards were one part of it you could control the synthesizer with any kind of voltage controlled input and we really designed the synthesizer and so our synthesizer in such a way that uh multiple people could play one instrument As in other words everyone now plays their own instrument you sit in front of your instrument that's your instrument your guitar player or drummer keyboard player but the reality is you're all each playing their own instrument. They're not really related to each other electrically or electronically. With Tonto, the instrument was interconnected. We had many keyboards and controllers, and we had many people playing one instrument at the same time. So it was not many instruments as many people. as three of us, like Stevie, me, and Malcolm, would play the synthesizer simultaneously. We all had certain things that we would do and uh, it, it philosophically, it was going in the other direction. The interesting thing is that basically, when you think about recording something, okay, you think about taking a picture of a real of a real event. It's a take, right? But 
you're realizing a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional event, like a camera taking a picture. With electronic music, there are no real events. Everything is unfolding in your head and is vibrating electrons. There is no picture of a take. It's all inspired and takes place in your head. It unfolds in your head, is created in your head, and the instruments, a synthesizer is not an instrument that imitates a real instrument. It can, but the a true synthesizer takes vibrating electrons and manipulates them. So it's a, a much more inspirational event. It is not a take of a real time event at all. It's totally serial. It happens over many hours and many layers. It has no relationship to the real world at all. What we did with Stevie is we took that and combined it with some real instruments and some real keyboards. And we came up with this wonderful hybrid sound, which was uh, neither a take of reality or a uh, totally generated in the computer. It was a sort of a mixture of both elements. And I think that that's what really attracted us. Stevie heard zero time and he came to the studio on that Sunday afternoon in a July, I think it was, it was hot in a chartreuse jumpsuit. I'll never forget it. Mm-hmm. And I looked down there and there he was standing at the door of the studio, banging on the studio door. It was Sunday. The studio was closed. And uh, we started working together and we didn't look up for five years. That was an unbelievable, one of the best five years in the history of popular music. I have here the first uh, music in my mind. I did that album cover. That's my art direction, too, on that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, So Superwoman, that's a good example of the fruit of your early labors, right? I would say so. Good bass sound on that. Yeah. But you notice one thing about the early records, the earlier ones, like Talking Book 2. There are really very few instruments on it. It's really basically a quartet. There's not a lot of orchestration. There's not waterfalls of sounds or stuff of a uh, high uh, degree of ledger domain. It was all kind of earthy, you know, bass, drums, and guitar and keyboards, basically. There's nothing fancy about the music. It's just good songwriting, but rendered in a new space. Where fantastic, fantastic songs. and. Well, and it gave the feeling of that one-man band. You know, Stevie Wonder was this one-man band. Little did we know at the time the sort of wizards behind the curtain helping out. Yeah, some guy, uh, some press thing uh, called us uh, Stevie's Backroom Boffins. And it was kind of, in the end, we kind of didn't really get, we feel that we didn't really get the recognition we deserved during the time. But now... 40 years later, it's become apparent, you know, who was behind the curtain. And um, we all pulled our weight, you know, but it was, uh, it was important for Steve to have the structure. And uh, we brought that and we brought the discipline and we brought the sense of adventure with the synthesizer. He would play it, we would program it. You know, we would make the sounds and make sure that the thing started to have some form. We produced the records with Stevie. We were all equal. And now, how, how many how many hours or how many takes? You know, how what, what kind of period of time would it take to uh, let's say make a song like Superwoman? Well, the thing that's interesting is that um, we never really kept track of the hours of how long a song took because we never really sort of worked with the concept with Steve anyway, of ever making, of now we're gonna do music of my mind. This is an album. We have to do 12 songs and so forth. And then we would concentrate on doing 12 songs. We would work for an archive, for a library. We were constantly in the studio. Some of the songs we did in the first year ended up on Talking Book or ended up on Fulfilling This. It was really generating material for a library is the way it worked. It was an archive of songs. And Malcolm and I would have a little book and I'd say, Steve, you know, we should really put, uh, we should really do this little sound. Do you want to do a little sound montage for Living for the City? We could do that tonight. Or do you want to do, uh, you know, some background parts on the Boogie on Reggae Woman? Or do you want to 
experiment on this song or that song. And we would slowly bring songs to the table. And the first song, the first album, uh, Music of My Mind, I said, Steve, we're going to put pictures of your life inside your glasses because the, those pictures on the cover are what you're thinking about. You know, the, you're, the pictures you see are inside your mind, music of my mind, right? So it was a kind of a curious connection to his uh, inner pictures, his inner world. And uh, we would work along, and then when we say, oh, it's the, they call for Motown and Steve was being very independent at that time, and he's um, he was not under contract any longer. He could do whatever he wanted, and uh, we pretty well had the run of things. We no one bothered us. There was not a lot of people around. There were no hangers on in the studio. It was just the three of us, and uh, slowly we would pull an album together. And then, of course, we had Armstrong Automation. I mean, you had to do this. There was no computers of that at that time right so then when it came to mixing the records uh, interestingly enough steve myself and malcolm would all be at the console together and we'd all have faders and moves and stuff to do we called it armstrong automation and uh pretty much the records were mixed that way um, how, how long robert did it take for stevie to feel comfortable uh, with those controls and that setting? It was pretty instantaneous. We never really say, oh, you have to learn this or that. We just we just assumed a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, the interesting thing to remember, too, is that after me media, when we finally we went from media to Electric Lady, uh, that's the strange connection with Cerebrum, that goes way back to the beginning of my talk with you. The Cerebrum was a nightclub designed by John Storick. Electric Ladyland, Electric Lady Studios, was John Storick's first commission. Mm -hmm. And he built that studio for Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. And when Jimmy passed, that was the first home studio, really. It was built specifically for Jimmy. It wasn't by RCA Records, Columbia Records Studios, union guys, white shirts, pencil protector type guys. It was a totally, it was an extension of that early, it's kind of very lucid, uh, colorful uh, nightclub, like Cerebrum. Re Electric Lady was like a nightclub. It had colored lights and dimmers, and it was very beautiful. Steve didn't appreciate the lighting particularly, but he could find his way around there, and when Jimmy passed, there was a studio, and it was like with Malcolm, me, and Stevie. It was like putting our shoe in a ready, our foot in a ready-made shoe. We were able to get in there and to really get to work. It was beautiful environment to work. We started four thirty in the afternoon and finish at seven in the morning when the sun was coming up. Night after night, holidays, birthdays, rains, sleet, summer storms, you name it, we were there. Never. Was, we called it Stevie time. It was never a, uh, and we didn't have to leave and leave because uh, Crazy Daisy Toilet Paper is going to be making a commercial during the day, and I had to break down the drums. Everything could stay, and uh, that gave me a, a wonderful opportunity to really evolve our audio. Then uh, about a year and a half into that, uh, Motown decided to move from Detroit to L.A. Stevie wanted to be in L.A. He'd made a deal with them for his big record deal. And we came out here and landed at a place called Crystal Studios. And I first then started doing a uh, very interesting approach in the studio, especially at the record plant later on. We, went, we then got booted out of Crystal because we wanted to be there all the time. And ahead of the clients, it was only one studio. So we had to leave and... Gary Kelgren came on board and he had built the record plant out here. And he said, he invited me and Malcolm up to his house, which was on the Camino Palmero, it was the old Canadian embassy. It looked like something out of Charles Adams' adventure. It was really kind of spooky looking and everything. And we sat down at his dining table and he said, you guys need a studio. I will build a studio for you exactly the way you want to have it. All right. If you bring Stevie over here. And we stood up 
and we he brought out the Cavassier bottle with the spider webs on it, the whole deal, right? And we stood up around the dining room table with our ponies in hand, and we clinked the glasses, and there was an earthquake just at that moment. Oh, yeah. And I think that was really God speaking to us. I think that there's a deeper, profound meaning in that meeting. But nonetheless, John Storer came out from New York. Gary Kelvin got involved. Tom Hidley got involved. And we ended up building Studio B at the record plant. You could not make a bad record in that studio. I don't care. You could go in there and take a dump on the floor. It would be a hit. Okay. So what was the first album that came out of that studio? uh talking book talking book yeah so here's yeah and that yeah. that happens to be my photograph of steve on the cover i took that picture and where, the picture. Where, where is the picture high in the hollywood hills just under the hollywood sign six o'clock in the morning <laughs> out of a recording session and the robes that he is wearing uh were designed and created by ola hudson why is that important well ola's son is slash Oh. Mm -hmm. Saul Hudson is Stevie's friend. She's gone now, unfortunately. She's a very talented designer. We all got there in the morning, 6 o'clock, took the picture just as the sun was coming up. The first cover with Braille on it. You know, well, did, At that point, did you already know all the songs for the record and, and that kind of thing, or was it still? Not really. It's always, in, with Steve, it's always, and to this day, I'm sure, it's always in a state of flux, but that's his magic. You know, you have to really sort of exist in the time. The interesting thing that really emerged out of the record plant, which is something I'm still working with, which is headphone surround, which I'm now dealing with, with immersive audio for virtual reality, is that I was able to set up the monitoring in Studio B so that it was immersive. There were two speakers in the front and two speakers in the back. They were all Hidley monitors, but they were all at ear level. So what I could do is I could bring Stevie into the control room, put the Fender Rhodes behind the console and the clavinet and his wah-wah pedals and all this stuff, and I could put the Rhodes, Fender Rhodes sound in the back, the clavinet sound in the front, the guitar over here, the kunkas over there, and actually, Stevie could um, occupy the same space as the music. It wasn't a take like I was talking about earlier. Well, here's a picture of the band. It's going to play, and the illusion is it's going to play for three and a half minutes, and that's the record. And you assume when you turn it on, it, it all happened at the same time. It didn't happen all at the same time. You know that, right? But well, most people assume that that was some five, four or five people playing together at the same time, which was never the case. OK, but in creating this space for surround, basically, in headphones, which I'm doing now, but being able to create that immersive space enabled us to really get the sounds the right way and for Stevie to have a relational experience with the spatial relationships of his music. For example, if you take a set of drums, right, and you do a fill across the tom-toms, OK, and you record that in stereo, you hear the fill go across the sound field, right? Mm -hmm. That motion is as musical as the tonality and the pitch and the song. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the music has motion. Spatial. And, right, spatial motion. So when the guitar player is in the studio and he's, he's riffing and there's a bass player on the other side or a synth player on the other side, they're able to talk to each other musically. We were able to achieve that in the control room, and most of the stuff that we did from the from the record plant on out was done under those conditions of monitoring. We couldn't deliver at that time virtual sound, immersive audio, because we didn't have the technology to support it. We tried it with vinyl; it didn't work. Okay, so now what we had there is we had the very beginnings of immersive audio. And the reason that these records sound so dry and crisp is because I never really, I'm not a big fan of reverb. Mm. Why? Because I can be inside the record. I'm not, to me, reverb and echo connotate distance. How far away you are from something. Not, not as an effect of creating distance. I don't want to be at the back of the hall. 
I want to be right here. And uh, those records kind of reflect that philosophy. There, and that's a, there's an intimacy there. Um, and I think also, especially in Talking Book, and even on Music in My Mind, the layering of Stevie's vocals really gives it a lot of that haunting quality, that sort of ethereal feeling. How much work did he put into that? It depends on the song and the mic choice. I mean, a lot of stuff we use the dynamic mic. People are very surprised at that. A lot of his vocals were done with an RE20. Uh, the reason is he could touch the microphone. And he could uh, use the mic English of closeness and proximity to the capsule. Some of the more sweeter ballads, ones we used in uh, an 87 or a 414. But basically, it was a very simple chain, LA3A. Really good first class preamp, a uh, very good uh, LA3A or a Flickinger or an 1176 limiter, and directly to the tape with very, very little EQ. What I like to do is when we did EQ it, based on the song and everything else, we didn't re EQ the UQ. Once we started mixing, we weren't fixing anything, we weren't EQing it again. It did what we wanted in the sounds we got when we did the recording. And when he did the mixing, I could generally just put all the faders up to the dot of maximum resolution for the uh, for the amplifier, mm -hmm. and the level was correct. The, all the relational energy was correct in the recording. So the mixing was not really a feat of ledger domain. It was very straightforward. We tried some mixing in quad, but. Again, we couldn't deliver it. The vinyl could not sustain the up and down motion for one channel and a left right motion for the other. And it never really sounded. My first quad recording in the world and quad mix was Superstition. And uh, I did a remix, I think it's on my website uh, in uh, Here 360 immersive audio of uh, Superstition. And you start, it reveals a lot of different things. Back, back, back then, did you do it in the discrete format that they had? Yes, it was in four channel. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't do it now. The strange irony of all of this is I'm currently working with a group called Test Shot Starfish, which is also a very strange name like Tonto's Expanding Headband, right? And these are guys who are doing ambient electronic music, music for space travel. And uh, we're doing huge uh, soundscapes, again, just like Tonto. Here I am 40 some odd years later, living across the street from the first studio I ever worked in in Los Angeles and playing, again, looking at music through Tonto's glasses. That's the well, only way I can say it. And where is this music? Where can you hear this music today on Test Shot Starfish? On the SpaceX launches of this last one, Iridium, which was uh, night before last, when uh, the guy who is in the band also works for SpaceX and produces the uh, these wonderful video streams of the launches. And there are these long places where the sh ships are in transition and changing orbit from the first thing to the second thing. And there's like these 15 and 16 minute windows where you just see the graphics happening and all our music is happening under there right now people are listening to it again it's it's just crazy i am just loving it that's great well you, ahead of your time obviously oh I'm, having, oh I'm loving it because you know something it's a big circle you know i'm just doing that again now and i i feel like i never left that space working with a company called here 360 and we're developing you know, virtual microphones, uh, one called the Eight Ball, which you can see on your uh, on your website. I'm not making a commercial for it, but I'm just saying it listens in surround, and the software is the software I'm using to now mix all of the space music in headphones surround. And it's absolutely fantastic. What impressed you the most uh, about Stevie Wonder back then? his abilities as a creative and a musician and to have, you know, God might've taken his eyesight, but 
there really was music of my mind. It all unfolds in Stevie's head. He's not a perfect human being. None of us are. But he really was touched by the hand of God. I cannot explain his talent. It's totally inexplicable. I don't know where it came from or why he does it, what he does. But I do know this, that his music changed my world and I think changed the world in general in a positive way. I am trying right now very hard to talk Stevie into doing some new music again to write because we're in the same kind of thing that we were with living just enough for the city. We need strong political human rights. There's that cover. Yes. The, yeah. the, this to me is definitely one of my favorite albums of all time, but I think one of the greatest works of the pop era and living for the city is just an incredible work. Yeah. Funny stories there. Um, living for the city, the truck, the bus stop sound, that was an oil truck at three o'clock in the morning. It was delivering heating oil to media sound. I went outside, ran outside with a Nagra and I said, drive away and he drove room room and did that and then you hear new york just like i remembered it right yeah. and, uh, that was his brother that said that and uh, 30 years or whatever it was in there and you hear the big jail clink that's his lawyer johanna vagoda saying that so it was all and the police bust i did in great neck my father was the mayor of great neck estates so I had access to the police department. So I went out there with my Niagara and they busted me in the park and I recorded it. It was the first Sonic movie. It was a movie soundtrack. Mm -hmm. And that's really what soundscapes are about. Those little fragments of reality. I, I begged Quincy, I want to say, let me do some stuff with Juke Joint where we could create these little sound vignettes and little stories in audio just comes from radio drama. I mean, it's not a new invention, but to incorporate in the music and living just enough of the city is that thing. Uh, loving you, Minnie Ripperton, right? With the birds. It's another one that we did with Steve that uh, also reflects the use of sound effects inside the music. It helps take you to a place and gives the music a sense of place and uh, important. The, the drum sound you got too, I love. The drum sound is really good. Dry, dry, dry. I like being, I like when Stevie sits to the drums, I like you to have his experience, not to put it down on the end of a hallway. If you listen very carefully, you'll see that the hi-hat comes up on the left of all of Stevie's recordings. Why is that? Well, it's because of the drummer's point of view. The hi-hat is on the left, not the right. You get 15 feet from a drum kit, you hearing it in mono, you know? Would, would he decide to bring a harmonica to something like um, Too High, or did you or uh, Malcolm suggest it, or how would that kind of thing take place? We'd listen around and see what he wanted to put on. So we, sometimes we experiment with the synthesizer. Sometimes he'd go with the harmonica. It depends, depending just on the song like, and the sonic picture we wanted to create. The interesting thing is we have to really understand this. This is the big this is the big takeaway, the big learn for me as far as the technology is concerned. The technology drives the art. It's not the other way around. When we first started, we were recording, you know, dance bands on a stage somewhere, Glenn Miller or whoever, right? Artie Shaw, all the big bands. We tried very hard to have a live band and we recorded it all at once. It went to mono and it was over. And then electronica slowly started creeping in. Could we have Bing Crosby a crooner without him being able to get this close to the microphone to go ba ba boo, ba ba boo, right with a whole orchestra behind him? No, the technology was beginning to drive the art, right? And now there is no more location there's no more architecture we're not creating songs for an architectural space anymore this isn't the picture of a dance hall this isn't the picture of cbgb's this isn't that it is not a festival stage it has gone completely inside our heads 
the architecture is in our head. It's no longer in front of us. We're not creating a picture of reality at all. It's a totally impressionistic, inspirational creation of someone's brain, someone's thought, and it unfolds in your head on earphones. But it's, is, there, is there something potentially lost also, do you think? No, I think something lost and something gained. It's called evolution. 